All right, so today we have Paul Boucher from the Right Voice Communications joining us today to talk a little bit about his journey and uh, his unique talent that he brings for, I would say, a pretty cool company here in Alberta. Um, so thank you for joining us today, Paul. Oh, my pleasure, Chris. Thank you for the invitation. So Paul, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us about what you do and maybe how did you get into this uh, communications business? <laughs> well, I was a radio broadcaster for a long time. Um, and then what happened was somewhere along the way, uh, the opportunity, we always had to do commercials after our shift. You know, we would finish our air shift and then it would be kind of like off to the studio to do commercials. And I wound up loving that piece as much as I used to love being on the air. So that was important. And the reason that I'd wound up in radio anyway, I was 15 years old when I got my first radio job. Uh, was simply that uh, I had been disrespectful to my existing supervisor uh, and I'd been, I had been fired. And so because I was bilingual, I could uh, talk and read at the same time, I got hired to record the news first or do the news first, and then eventually moved into being an on-air disc jockey for 23 years. Oh, wow. um, yeah, and, and it was just a lot of really good experience in a lot of different places impossible to enumerate all the many patient mentors and bosses who put up with how terrible I was at the beginning and who mentored me into a much better place where I can do what I do now. You've been in the business for so long. You know, what are your perspectives on some of the changes that has happened in the in industry? And, and, and what, what kind of do you see is happening for, in terms of the changes in the future of, uh, call it broadcast radio? Uh, you know what, broadcast radio, I think is, What's happened in the Canadian industry from my experience is we all started working at radio stations that were owned by small ownership groups. Many of them, uh, they were family ownership groups um, and they were local a lot of the time or even regional. What's happened is that just like the Americans, we were about five years behind that trend. The radio stations started to consolidate into these much bigger ownership groups. As a result, a template would be applied for, you know, for different ownership groups. So what would happen is, you know, Rogers would be known for say it's easy listening or it's light formats right. and, you know, that kind of thing. And so all of the same restrictions and, you know, requirements were applied to all the radio stations, regardless of where they were and everything else. What happened, I think partially as a result was that a lot of the uniqueness of individual stations was eroded. So, yeah. You know what? I mean, where you used to have something that was really cool in Red Deer, for example, you used to be able to go to Sylvan Lake and you'd have this one rock station that just was what it was. Yeah. Um, now it became the same as the rock station owned by that same ownership group in every other place. Right. So I think for a lot of announcers and a lot of people who were drawn to the to the media for creative reasons, whether it was to the music or whatever else, it just became a less interesting space to work in. Having said that, though, the the industry exposes you to a lot of really interesting things, including, you know, aspects that are possible job opportunities. You could go into promotions, you could go into copywriting. So there's no shortage of creative endeavors. In my case, it was technology. We were at the very, in the mid eighties, we were exposed to laptop computers. You might remember the first laptops were Tandy laptops. They were eight yep. line screens, yep. <laughs> 14 <laughs> baud modems, if they were even that fast. <laughs> And uh, we all were on them because in FM in the 80s in Canada, we used to have uh, a requirement that we used to have to write three enrichment pieces every night. And they would be about specific artists. And FM was at that time regulated to 50% non-hit. So what was great about that was it exposed you to all kinds of great music. And so we had to learn a lot about a lot of different artists that weren't necessarily mainstream. And we used to have to write. But what it also did was it gave us an email address in 1985. It put us on online, as it nice. was then, CompuServe, Prodigy, AOL. Um, but it, it gave us newspapers a day ahead of publication, USA Today in particular. So it just gave us some insight into what was coming. So by the time that the web came around, we were in. And so a whole bunch of the people that I worked with went into programming, um, I was coding web pages by hand, you know, at the dawn of the web, uh, yep. built my own website, the radio station's website, all those things. And so it led very naturally into being very comfortable in this kind of a medium 
where you and I are interacting virtually. I mean, this is pretty much my life every day anyway. <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice. Um, so as as you switched, call it switched your, um, what you do now from what you did on radio, can you talk to me a little bit about how you landed your first gig? Uh, how'd that come about? <laughs> You know, I was in Lethbridge and I will never forget it because I would ever I would always say now to prospective people, don't ever do this. Um, I was working at the radio station in Lethbridge. And back then, what you have to understand is that we weren't as easy to find simply because the technology wasn't there to find people. Right. There were no voice casting sites. Um, there were no things like that. So what happened is they would hear us on the radio and go, oh, this guy can do commercial. So the TV station in Lethbridge called us up at the radio station and said, hey, would you be interested in doing this commercial? We'll pay you 25 bucks. Nice. Well, salaries and radio being what they are, uh, we, we thought, yeah, sure, we'll do it. Absolutely. <laughs> and so we would go in and we couldn't believe we were getting paid for this because we didn't get paid for any extra at the radio stations. So uh, now what's interesting, you asked me about some of the stuff that's coming. I was in a conversation the other day. That job now, that initial freelance job might not actually go to a person. Synthetic voice apps and synthetic voice platforms are getting to be so sophisticated that they're actually, and I will use this in hyphens, but it's true, good enough to almost pass for human in some cases. Um, so I don't know that that same opportunity would exist for somebody who was in my position back then who needed the gig. But from there, I eventually made my way to Calgary. And in Calgary, there was a recognition that my being bilingual, because English is my second language, right. could be really handy, especially for corporate narration. And what a lot of people tend to forget about Calgary is it's got over 115 head offices here. Yeah. And just by virtue of the law, they often have to present their training material, their orientation stuff, all bilingually. And so my first bilingual narration gig in Calgary was for the CRA, or as it was known back then, Revenue Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting first gig. <laughs> Truly, yeah. Uh, yeah, a short little corporate piece. How has that changed throughout the years in terms of diversification of your client base? One of the most interesting things, I think, for me is that I happened to very accidentally land myself in a niche. Because I was on the air all the time, a lot of local clients didn't want to actually hire me because I was already so pervasive in the market. I was already on the air, you know, five hours a day, every day. And then I would show up at bars, do gigs for the radio station there. Um, and so I wound up looking for non-broadcast work. So the, some of the corporate video work that you've seen, um, you know, whether it's introductory stuff at an awards presentation or things like that. Um, you've attended plenty of seminars where there's been this, you know, ghost-like voice that shows up up front. So now, please welcome your host. So I do a lot of that. Um, most recently for say like uh, Deloitte is a good example of a company I've done that for. Um, but e-learning, which was at the time multimedia, my first e-learning gig was for Microsoft, teaching people how to use Office 97. Oh, wow. And it was all done here locally by a company that no longer exists called Discoverware, although a lot of the people who are um, who were in that company still do work for many companies locally. What happened was in the early aughts, the bandwidth wasn't there to distribute long training. So all the training was shorter. Now that training has evolved because bandwidth allows for much longer courses. And so I, I narrate a lot of, I'm narrating a 90 minute course right now for a company in town. One of the biggest custom e-learning companies in the country happens to be in Calgary. And the other thing that they've gotten into, which has been fun is virtual reality. So now, right you're hosting people as they're exploring the underside of a huge mining truck or whatever oh, wow. it happens to be, right? Yeah, so yeah. those are fun. You almost feel like you're part of a video game for people. And, you know, these companies have obviously a vested interest in those assets staying, you know, functional. When yeah. these trucks are worth a million dollars, it's better to have these people experience it this way first and then move on to actually having to do the truck. So I do a lot of that. Um, I do a lot of French movie trailers, um, a lot of commercial work, uh, wherever I can get it. But training, I would say, is still by far the majority of what I do. You know what's interesting, Paul, when I was uh, when I first went on your website and I started hearing your various samples, I'm like, that's the voice. That's the voice I hear all the time when I'm, you know, and it just reminds me. I remember a few years ago, a friend of mine and I, for some reason, we got on this topic. You know, that theater trailer voice, that deep. And we always said, that guy either like 
was born with that voice or like they are synthesizing it so it sounds that deep low but when i was listening to your samples i'm like you you have that like narrative natural is that something you had to practice or or you just you, you just have that no, uh, you know what? It, some of it you have, and some of it is a is an innate talent. But I, I my first director, because when we started in radio, we used to have to write our own copy and then go in and produce our own commercials, add the sound effects, the music, everything else on our own. So imagine that's all with the era of tape and splicing and turntables yeah. and yeah. My first director was a Calgarian, but it was in Grand Prairie when I was working at a radio station there, Norm Zanoli. And I remember it was the first time I had my own separate booth. I ha- I was in my own space and he was in his own control room. I was like, well, this is weird. <laughs> and he said, okay, well, go ahead and do a take. And so I did the take and I was, I was literally pulling the headphones off. He says, no, 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 hang on. Can you give me another take? I'm like, another take? Why? <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was my first experience of kind of being coached through uh, other than just the paper direction. And then the probably the most important single person after that, there've been a lot of really valuable mentors to me in a lot of different ways, but the most important person after that would be a guy named Amin Batia, who's since gone on to win all kinds of awards as a composer for movies in Canada. He lives in Toronto now, but he was our radio producer when I worked here in Calgary. And I mean, he was meticulous and exacting in the best possible way. And he was so positive and created a nice safe space for us to do really stupid things behind the microphone. (laughs) So we learned, you know, through great scripts, really good producers, very patient people um, who would occasionally tell us, no, no, that was genuinely terrible. Let's try that again. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And so you do it again and and you learn. And I've coached with uh, people who have cast for Disney down in the States. I've traveled to seminars down there to learn with peers and with with facilitators. Uh, There's a woman named Maurice Tobias, who is known as the voice whisperer, who is the coach to the stars. She's taught people like Kiefer Sutherland, Donald Sutherland, how to, you know, how to do voice work. And Donald Sutherland, as an example of somebody who's really interesting, has always had kind of an anti-hero persona on screen. Yeah. But his voice is so warm and sympathetic that he couldn't really reconcile the two. And so Maurice kind of coached him to, you know, hey, this is your persona. Your voice's persona is this. It can exist separately from your acting persona. And that was a huge lesson for all of us who followed in his footsteps, right? Like there's a lot of that. But those, a lot of the things that you hear us do, they're they're basically tricks of the mic. And it's a little harder to do with um, uh, with the AirPods as my microphone, but if you wanted to get um, a trailer kind of a thing, you know, the, the old cliche line is in a world, right? So you can speak in a world, but a lot of those things, I remember Maurice again coaching us and saying, okay, so your goal here is to speak so softly that if a candle is in front of your mouth, you're not gonna exhale enough air to put it out. Uh, so you're close up to the mic and it's right. in, in a world and you just and you just kind of inhabit that space and do what the copy tells you to do okay i have to try that next time (laughs) just to play around with it it sounds like you've gone through a lot of um you know you have a a wide variety of clients and i mean i see that on your website um, but clearly a lot of experience going through working for uh, different types of clients what's one of the i would say most memorable experiences you have uh in this industry um, I've, I've had lots of really genuinely fun gigs and, and uh, working with really cool producers and directors. Uh, Bo Shaminsky here in town works at Ear Candy. Uh, he's a musician, so he directs like an artist. Uh, and I find going into a session with Bo, <laughs> I learn a little something about myself every time because he usually extracts something from me that I wouldn't have necessarily gone to. I had to do a commercial and not related to Bo this time. It was an audition sent for Axe. Um, and I thought Axe, uh, but Axe body know, spray, Axe body spray. Yeah. Uh, and what it was, was I had to sing in the audition like Leonard Cohen. Oh, and so I thought, well, this is going to be fun. So sure enough, they had the English track. So I had something to kind of base myself off of. And so I sang a 60 second Axe body spray commercial, blow Leonard Cohen tones with in French. Um, but yeah, the Axe spray, I remember, 
I spent a couple of hours on that and it was just a blast. It was just a lot of fun. This is so interesting to me because, and, and this is the reason why I was very excited to do um, Amplify Alberta with uh, this professional life, because I knew, you know, there's only so many companies I know of and industries I know of in Alberta, and we all know the big ones, right? Energy, and, and we know there's a tech boom, but just listening to you tell me about, you know, the media production, music production, it seems like there's just a big world in Alberta alone, and companies and people like you doing work for big multinationals that we hear about like how how big is this side of the industry in Alberta and and is it a growing one or are you seeing seeing it kind of shrink a little bit uh you know it, it's interesting uh, first of all it, it is a bigger industry partly because my skill ties into say the bigger Alberta film and television industry um, because television will often require our skills um uh, that's a it's a many millions of dollars a year business. I wish I had the right numbers for you, but I don't know if I do. It's certainly, well, it's got to be close to at least a billion dollars of, of actual business done in Alberta around film and TV. Wow. So in Calgary, the number of actual studios uh, has dropped, but stabilized. Um, and they're still able to command their rates because they do a lot of uh, processing and audio post for shows like Hell on Wheels, um, there's one studio in town. Well, actually all of the studios in town. So the, and when I say all of the studios, that's ear candy, um, six degrees. Uh, let me think I'm going to forget somebody propeller, um, and the forge audio, they all do audio post on productions for Netflix, for major film production, for major television production. Um, one of the guys that I have the privilege of working with from time to time is a guy named Jason Lawrence. He was an Emmy nominated dialogue editor for his work on Fargo, the first season of Fargo. Mm. And, and that was all done at Propeller um, so wow. in town. So there's a lot of those studios in Calgary and Edmonton in particular that do some of that post. And yeah. they've been working really, really hard to develop their infrastructure so that they don't lose the post work to the studios in Vancouver and Los Angeles, because that's typically what happens, partly yeah. because those places actually have physical mixing theaters where you can mix for film. Yeah. But now Propeller, as an example, is the first Atmos, fully Atmos certified studio in Alberta to be able to mix for Dolby Atmos. And oh, if you've wow. never been to a movie, like Tenet, the Christopher Nolan movie, made yeah. full use of that tech, the sound doesn't just come from behind and around you, it comes from above you as well. Wow. So it adds that dimension of, it really is atmosphere around the sound and so yeah. propeller is the first of the alberta studios to have that tech and they do that for companies worldwide so i want to switch the conversation a little bit to obviously more about COVID. that's one of the things i've been asking a lot of the um businesses that i've been interviewing is is how COVID has impacted them and how they've pivoted and has co has COVID impacted your business and and if so you know how have you kind of pivoted a little bit to adapt to the new environment um, it did, and here's how it did. So if you exa if you think of Suncor as one of the clients that I've done a lot of narration for, CNRL, a lot of the energy companies, they all put a freeze on everything last March and April. So that included, do we really need onboarding training since we're not hiring anybody right now? We're not doing this kind of training. How do we, you know, how do we rationalize this expense? So that there was a lot of uncertainty created at the beginning of the pandemic, and. Pardon me. The other thing that disappeared for me was movie trailer work. Yeah. Nobody's making movies. So all those French movie trailers that had made yeah. up a significant chunk of revenue were all of a sudden gone. Right. So overall, last year, I'd say I was 20 to 30 percent down. It depends how you look at it and what you measure. Mm -hmm. What I'm finding this year is I've got a couple of different business opportunities that put me back at a pre-pandemic level, even without restoring the movie trailer work. Um, and even, uh, and I've developed all kinds of new relationships um, with new clients who require training for industries that aren't reliant on the energy companies. So, right. you know, it, it's really tough when your biggest client has as their biggest clients, you know, CNRL, Suncor, TechCoal, uh, Syncrude, all of which are understandably in a position to be a little tighter with expenses and, and uh, what they're throwing out the door. So that's where I find, you know, it's funny as a bilingual Canadian, I, I hadn't really explored the federal government as much as I really should have. 
But that's my biggest business development opportunity uh, along with the Alberta government in 2021, simply because I have a bit more time to devote to learning how to navigate their portals, learning how to go through that whole process because it is a rabbit hole. Like, oh yeah, yeah, government tenders and contracts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's, I think, but it's funny because it, it does tend to be a po- as a possibility, one of the biggest potential sources of revenue for people like me who do a lot of this kind of work to begin with. So now it's just a matter of learning their language and their jargon. And um, I have to say the federal government is super helpful. They provide people at Public Service Canada who will go out of their way to make it easy for you to, yeah. you know, to learn the process and go from there. Yeah. Well, Paul, I, I, I want to thank you for taking uh, time out of your busy schedule to join us today and sharing your story and opening up at least my eyes on this uh, whole other industry in Alberta, uh, which I think is worthwhile exploring. So, you know, hopefully you and I can get together uh, more this year to explore. I think there's a story to be t- told here. Um, and I'm actually quite excited about that. So, so thank you, Paul, for enlightening us today on uh, this industry and your company, The Right Voice. And we'll put a link down below. And we got a few clips that uh, Paul has graciously shared for us and given us permission uh, to add into this. So you can kind of get an idea of the type of work Paul does. And if you do need narration and voiceover, uh, make sure to contact Paul. He's the guy to go go to. Thank you, Chris. And in turn, thank you for providing Alberta entrepreneurs with a terrific opportunity to literally amplify Alberta. It's awesome. You're welcome. Thanks, Paul. Thanks so much. I was born of the mountains. Among tall timbers. By healing waters. Near this birthplace of national parks. There, others stand still and watch the valley. The busy forests alive with bird and beast. There go the mountaineers to watch over travelers. Welcome to a world of more than one trillion wirelessly connected devices. A world made possible by a 5G ready infrastructure based on ARM technology. Here, intelligence is distributed throughout the network, applying compute where needed for the lowest latency and optimal efficiency. Devices using 5G connectivity to help streamline manufacturing, drive transportation, support smart cities, automate logistics, enrich our home life, and even improve healthcare. 